both audio and uh, and the uh, screencasts, and we'll get going. Okay, so um, this is the uh, first of two sessions uh, for this week, um, and uh, in today's session, I'm hoping to cover at least three broad things. Number one, we're going to be talking about another element of the vocabulary of these models. The vocabulary, I argue, is fairly large compared to classic stock and flow modeling, with discussion of messaging. Messages being a communications medium from uh, one uh, entity in the model to another, or one component of the model to another. In this case, we're going to see how agents can send messages to one another to influence one another communicate information and to uh, to change behavior of another agent. So that's the first thing I'd like to talk about. The second thing I'd like to talk about is um, another element of vocabulary, uh, which is what's known as, as events, or, or what I'll refer to as explicit events in the model. Um, it turns out that beneath the covers, uh, any logic is an event oriented framework in the sense that the way in which um, it uh, solves the model, the way in which it simulates the model is jumping from event to event to event. And um, within, within an H-based simulation, you can create what are known as event objects. And they come in two varieties, static and dynamic. And these event objects can schedule things for you within the model. For example, you might want to schedule an agent's birthday, and on the birthday, perhaps collect some information every year from that agent and put it in a database. That might be one thing. Um, another event might have to do with um, needing to periodically update the global environment. Um, and uh, another sort of event might be a, an event that we schedule now, but we want it to happen later, and we can create new such events at any number of different times, um, a so-called dynamic event. So we're going to be discussing events as a second topic today. The third topic today that um, I'm planning to get to is a little tutorial to help you understand some of the Java code we're writing. I've been kind of brushing that under the surface, but I think it's time that we discuss what some of these snippets really mean and uh, give you some grounding for how you put together similar snippets yourself within, uh, within these models. Now, if time allows, we'll get into the network space uh, as well. And I'll be watching the clock. Um, because some people here may have Java background sufficient to, uh, to allow them to, uh, to be very familiar with these snippets of code up front, I'm going to be saving that tutorial for the latter component, the latter hour or so of today's lecture. And I'll be watching the time. If we can get to networking before that, we'll get into it a little bit. Otherwise, we'll, we'll leave networking for Friday, two days from now. OK? OK, so um, first topic today is concerns um, messaging. Um, we saw last time how we could build up a model in which agents uh, contained state charts. So a state chart defined uh, modes of agent evolution. And there could be one or, or more such state charts. It's a convenient way of describing agent behavior. We further situated those, uh, those agents within networks, where those networks captured relationships between the agents that could either be static or indeed dynamic. And uh, we'll see within the next few lectures how you can have fully dynamic networks and dynamic populations, cases where friendships or marriages um, are, are made and broken between agents. Today we're going to be talking about a key uh, enabler for a lot of research questions involving networks and indeed involving any sort of agent interaction, be it spatial or, or within networks, or indeed just in broader populations. And specifically, we're going to talk about coupling agents' behavior um, using what's called messaging. Okay? Um, there's 
several ways in which agents communi can communicate, and, and we'll actually see a few models that show other ways as well, such as via stocks and flows. But the way I want to introduce, the, the method I want to introduce today is the dominant method, and that is uh, via messaging. So message, uh, your agents send messages to one another, which are, you can think of it as kind of like an email, an email message. And the, like an email message um, can contain attachments, the messages agents can send to each other, or the environment can send to agents, for example, can contain payloads of sorts. They can contain extra information. So just as you can add a PDF or a you know, PowerPoint document or add a, uh, a text file or, or what have you to an email message, you can have the messages agents send to each other to have a bunch of information or minimal, minimal information. And agents can send messages to one or more other agents um, or can be sent messages by the environment. Frequently these messages are sent locally to neighbors within some environment. So to neighboring nodes on a network or to neighboring nodes in space like that SIR agent-based model we saw some time ago where you have those waves of infection, which were the result of agents sending messages involving infection to their neighbors uh, in the, the cardinal directions. Okay, now these messages, it turns out, um, once they're sent and received by an agent, they can be handled in many ways. So uh, just as when someone sends you an email, it gets handled by a mail server, and, and you can then go get it at the mail server. It gets routed to that mail server. Once messages are received by an agent, they can get routed to different state charts, and then the state charts can, can deal with them. So the most common way of dealing with these messages is, is within state charts. Um, and transitions, for example, can be triggered by messages. And uh, such a transition, for example, might be associated with an action that, um, that goes on within the agent who's received it. Okay? Um, so I'd like to take a look here at uh, one of the built-in models. I've, I've asked you uh, to get ready to use some example models that I've provided you. But the very first model we're going to use is a sample model that comes with any logic. So uh, just to remind you uh, how you open such a model, we're going to go to any logic, go up to the help menu, and uh, go to example models. And you'll get a sort of splash screen here. We're going to go down to the SIR agent-based uh, model um, within here. And depending on sort of the vagaries of the situation, you may need to switch to the, to the healthcare um, component there, or it may be listed there directly. So here's uh, SIR agent base. You'll notice again there's three variants of it. We want SIR agent base, not SIR agent base calibration, and not SIR. Okay. So um, here what we've done is we've loaded in uh, the model, and it's it's located down here. This is a model we're going to be working with in a bit, which I also have loaded. So um, we're going to be going to the SIR agent base, and then I'd like you to open up the person class within there. And you folks may recall. Um, this class from uh, our last session, indeed from a couple sessions ago, when we first looked at this as a model to modify. And what we have here is, is a classic uh, progression um, having to do with the uh, evolution of, of disease, the, the natural history of disease in an individual from a susceptible state to an infectious state and a recovered state. And when we first talked about this, I kind of glossed over what was going on um, when someone, the mechanism by which someone becomes infectious. I simply commented that someone becomes infectious from their neighbors. We're going to look in detail at, at how this is accomplished. So what I'd like you to look at is the infection transition. Okay, so, so with that called up, I'd like you to open up this, um, this infection transition here. And uh, down at the, in the properties window, if you double click on that infection transition, you'll see some information on this transition. And you'll recall last time that we talked about a number of types of transitions. 
We talked about transitions that could go on at a fixed rate, um, analogous to the sort of logic that's of these flows. transition will fire in the event that a message is received by this agent. And um, in fact, it, it says something about the payload of the message. It says message type. In here, it says other. Um, and it's passed a, a so-called object. It's passed some sort of information um, that refers to a, a larger object. And you'll notice that there's further logic having to do with under what conditions this transition will go off once a message is received. Is it unconditional? So you get this message which matches this type and boom, you, you make the transition. Or does the message have to match some criteria um, as specified by an expression or just check if it equals some, some quantity? So here we have the capacity within a transition to make it conditional on message reception and, a, and specify the details of the type of message that has to be received. Oh, um, moreover, um, we, uh, we have an action that can be specified where this action can do something when this message is received. Okay? So not only will the transition be taken, the person will go from one state to another, but there'll be an action uh, taken as well. So um, here's uh, the logic from by which someone would move from susceptible to infected. They've received a message. Now, the flip side of that is the question of where that message comes from. And we're going to see that right now. Specifically, you'll see within the state chart a, um, a self-transition, a transition um, from that state to itself. Um, in other words, a transition that fires but doesn't leave the agent to leave the state. They stay in the same state, but something happens when that transition is, uh, occurs. So here we have a transition which occurs from the infectious state into the infectious state, and it occurs with a certain rate. So Implicit in this is conditional on you being in the infection state. This thing would never fire if you're not in that state. But once you're in that state, it's going to fire at a Poisson arrival, a certain chance per unit time that it will go off. And that likely a density, that chance per unit time, that hazard is given by this rate. going to go to someone within one hop from you in this grid. So if you're in a grid like this um, and you're located, the index person as it were is located say in this cell, um, it's only going to send it to an immediate neighbor, someone who's one hop away in the grid. And it turns out that the um, neighborhood definition, so within the environment, in which the space is defined, it's going to specify is it one of these four or is it one of these 
eight that would include northeast, southwest, southeast, and northwest. Um, so, uh, so it's going to sort of what what's considered a neighbor, random neighbor. What's considered a neighbor depends on the environment uh, definition. But in both cases, it's one hop away. The question is, do you count the diagonals as being one hop or two hops away? Okay. Um, so uh, uh, this is in a grid, yes. Um, so in this particular case, this random, excuse me, random neighbor here is defined as meaning um, a, uh, it's defined as meaning a neighbor within a set of, a set of uh, grid cells. Okay. Now this is germane because uh, in a few lectures we'll be talking about continuous space as well where you have not simply a bunch of cells broken up, but you have more or less continuous movement within this space. And uh, this is specifically if it's quantized, if it's broken into grid, grid cells, okay? So this whole aspect of message sending, sending off those messages which are later received, um, you can send them to an explicitly specified agent, pick out one, and you send it to that one. So you send it to you know, the president, or you send it to um, the neighbor with the lowest um, immunocompetence in your, your neighborhood, or lowest status, or what have you. Or you can specify an explicit class of agents, neighboring agents in the environment, um, or randomly agent and selected agents in the whole space, all agents, you can send it to all agents at once, kind of in a broadcast sort of way. Um, all agents that are connected to anyone or or um, uh, or any randomly selected connected agent. So there's a set of different subsets that you could uh, that you could send to, and those those would be specified here. So we could actually specify a particular a reference to a particular person here, or we could specify some some criteria. Um, so uh, we'll see a little bit more about this later, but um, the basic mechanism here is you send a, some specification of a message to a destination object, a, a person or, or the main environment, or to, uh, to a class of agents here, okay? Now messages can be sent in two ways. Um, uh, and without wanting to go into the gory details of, uh, in, with too much time, suffice it that to say you can set it asynchronously or synchronously. The recommended way is a uh, so-called asynchronous way. This is like sending a text message to someone. It's queued up and they deal with it when they're ready to. And generally speaking, that's less inconvenient for the person who gets it. They could be in the middle of a meeting, they can attend to the meeting as long as they need to, and then they can check the message and deal with it then. The, the alternative to this is, is a higher priority message of sorts. We call it a synchronous thing because immediately when you send it off, the neighbor is notified. It's as if you pick up the phone and you call them, and they have to answer their phone. And it interrupts them in the middle of whatever they're doing, uh, if they allow for that, or you may just sit there waiting for them to answer the phone. You may sit there for a long period of time. So, generally speaking, it's considered safer to do the text messaging, especially because in this mode, and the analogy with the phone kind of breaks down here, um, you can get infinite loops where I call, so A calls B, B calls A, A calls B, and you get sort of this, this, this loop that goes on. Asynchronous uh, message sending is generally preferred. So using the send rather than deliver is advised. There may be some cases where you want to use deliver, but uh, for the most part, send will be your, your way of sending the message. So when we send these messages, there are some conditions under which we, we can simply, simply the knowledge that a message has been received is sufficient for us to interpret that message. So in a lot of toy models, such as the one we have in front of us, there's only one sort of message around. You don't have to worry about different messages with different meaning. And 
So you really will have a transition that depends unconditionally on the message. It doesn't even, even have to look at the criteria of the message. Okay. Um, alternatively, we may have payloads that uh, are quite specific as to their meaning. Perhaps one message is, I infect you with TB, and other message is, I infect you with HIV. And they would go to different state charts. One would go to a TB state chart, one would go to an HIV state chart. Another message might be that I influence uh, your uh, hygienic practices. And that would go to perhaps yet a third state chart. So sometimes we have multiple types of methods. Um, messages, and we might provide them with payloads that, that specify sort of the type of message and some additional contextual information. For example, we might send along identity of the person who's infecting us. That might be the payload. You say, it's me who infected you. Um, alternatively, we may specify uh, details on you know when the infection took place or the location at which it took place or the, uh, the criteria by which they were selected or what have you. So, so this whole thing, and again, I'm going to switch back to this diagram here. Um, when we receive this message, we can specify the message type that this transition responds to. We can then unpack the payload and extract information from it if we're so inclined. So what we're seeing here in this model is, is a string payload. So if, if we go here and we, we go click on this again, we're sending a string. We're sending a, a set of characters, one that happens to say infection. Okay? We could specify other things here. It could say instead of infection, influence. Or it could say um, you know, uh, uh, assault. Or it could say um, you know, fr uh, befriending. And those would have different uh, meanings in terms of what actions are then expected. And someone who receives that message would do different things, presumably, depending on whether they're infected on the one hand or befriended on the other hand. Okay? Um, so uh, those are different uh, types of payloads we can send along. And uh, an alternative would be to send it along with a payload that says something meaningful. Here, for example, I could send this message with a payload that says who it is that sent the message to them. In other words, who it is that's infected them. So you recall that the reference this points to me. In my context, this refers, is kind of the way in which I refer to me. So here, I'm sending a message to a random neighbor with information on who it is that sent the message as the payload. And that allows the receiver to know who sent the message. Okay. It's not the only way. It turns out any logic provides another mechanism for getting that information. But this is an example of a payload that has some meaning. It's a payload that specifies some meaningful information on context. Another thing we could do is send the time or the current location where the contact took place or what have you. So um, that's an example of a payload. Now, basic gist we've been talking about we can send messages. They might be sent from a state chart, as we've seen here, with that self-transition. Or they might be sent at the very beginning of the simulation to infect the initial person. We want a simulation to start up with someone infected, and so the environment takes care of sending a message. That's, that's a common phenomenon. But in terms of receiving messages, we focused on reception of messages within a state chart. And that's all well and good. Most messages are handled within state charts, the large majority in agent-based agent models and in any logic in particular. So it's fitting that we focused our attention there. However, I've also mentioned within the last lecture that one of the attractions of state charts is the fact that we can have multiple state charts within a given agent. And I argued, moreover, that this helps us avoid the combinatorial explosion you see when you're disaggregating within uh, stock and flow models according to some attributes, where you have, you have to consider all different mixtures, say, of HIV states and TB states and different ages and different sexes, all within some set of, of stocks. And you do that most classically with 
with subscripts in a way that gets quite messy. Here, we can have different state charts for different concerns. We have a so-called separation of concerns. We have TB-related issues in a TB state chart. We have HIV-related issues in an HIV state chart. We have issues related to um, you know, aging in an aging state chart, perhaps, if you want to do it in a discrete way. We can have pregnancy state chart that specifies pregnancy status. And they can interact in some ways loosely but they're separated out neatly. Mm -hmm. And we can, more or less in a very modular way, sort of eliminate or add in new state charts quite readily. We don't have to consider every possible combination of one and the other explicitly, which blows up quickly. You have a cursor dimensionality which applies. So here, we have a one state chart, but imagine we had several state charts. How would the message know which state chart to go to? And it turns out there's a place associated with an agent that tells, for a given message, where do you send that message, okay? And the place it's located at is if you go over to person within this model, so you go click on person here and check the properties for person, and you go to the agent tab, hmm, what you'll see is there's a, uh, a little, uh, little thing here that says um, uh, on message received, and it also says forward message to state chart. You can actually specify it in more detail in on message received, but this provides you a, a, a sort of easy way if it's handled by only one state chart, you can simply say forward any message to here. If you want to be more specific, you have multiple state charts, you can check what the message is up here and route it accordingly. So you can send an HIV message to an HIV state chart, a TV message to a TV state chart, and a uh, message involving changing marital status to a marital status state chart. Yes? So you can have multiple state charts and have multiple messages. Yes. Can they cross, you say? Yes, you, you, you could have them cross. The person has a cold and they have yeah. HIV, so. Yes. Yeah, so in general, there's going to be, uh, there's often going to be some interaction. Now, the reason I mention HIV and TB is because of some people in the room you may know. Uh, HIV uh, worldwide is one of the foremost causes of opportunistic TB infections because it weakens the immune system so much. So uh, you, you may get a situation where your presence in a certain state, say, with respect to HIV, for example, later stage HIV or AIDS, may um, greatly enhance your risk of infection from TB. And so you'd have some interaction there. The, the probability of infection given exposure to TB is much higher if you're in certain states of the HIV state chart. But moreover, you could have a situation where the messages from one thing are additionally processed by other state charts. Um, to have it handled by two state charts simultaneously uh, is actually something which could be done here. You could route the message first to one state chart and then to another state chart, for example. Um, generally speaking, you're not going to have that occurring. I haven't seen that in an actual model. It's theoretically possible. Okay. Great question. Any other questions? Yes. Well, okay, so um, I have not uh, spent uh, time testing the limits, but I, I believe it's essentially uh, an arbitrary upper limit. So uh, for all intents and purposes, you can view it as limitless. Knowing something about the underlying software infrastructure on which this is built, I'd be surprised if, if it's less than 1,000 state charts per agent. Um, and uh, it would have to be a pretty big model to use that many state charts, right? Um, but I, I think you can view it as essentially limitless. I want to distinguish this from the situation with subscripts in stock and flow modeling. If you, if you use something like Vensim, I think Vensim's upper limit on the number of, um, of subscripts that you can use, which would be a way of sort of distinguishing aspects of heterogeneity, would be um, something on the order of uh, 9 to 12, it's right in there. And I've run up against that limit before with mixing matrices and infectious disease models. 
Um, so uh, there you're dealing with, with a much smaller number. And indeed, it, that reflects the fact that the scaling is totally different. You add a new state chart, it's a very modest impact on the running time of the model. You add a new subscript to a system dynamics model that, that has to be subscripted across the population, it has a huge impact you know, uh, on, the, on the running time. I want to draw uh, a contrast, though. If you were to double the population size, that has no impact on a stock and flow model running time. It doesn't matter if you're simulating a billion people or a thousand people. It's just numbers to it, differential equations that are being solved. Here, doubling the population size will at least double the running time of the model. Mm -hmm. Modulo issues with um, sort of uh, concurrent processing and so on. Um, you actually may get super linear scaling, so it may more than double it in some cases if you have very dense networks or what have you. So um, system dynamics, classic stock and flow models and agent-based models have very different scaling behavior. Scaling behavior that's different, that scales with respect to different criteria. On the one side, population size, uh, for agent-based models is a, a really big factor that determines performance. For, for stock and flow models, um, the heterogeneity you represent is a really big factor. Um, something that's almost free for one of them comes at great cost for the other, in short. Okay? Um, important principle. Sorry? Modular? What I mean by, it, by that is that um, uh, it's, it's separate. And it's something which can be added and deleted in a um, fashion that doesn't disturb all the other pieces. Um, it is uh, encapsulated in a way um, uh, such that uh, it isn't tightly, tightly coupled with respect to the other pieces. Okay. Um, okay, so we've seen receiving a message. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to add to get some hands-on experience in adding messaging into one of our models. So I had asked you, well, we had previously built up in class a model that was sort of a, a minimalist agent-based model in a network. Do you remember that? We built it up last time, in fact. Now, in case anyone wasn't there or had problems, you can get it, you can get a model called minimalist network ABM model from the example models I provide for this class, from the Stellar site, and you can download that. I also have an unzipped drive here if anyone wants it, um, that full zip. So just let me know if you want me to pass this around here. So there's a, a model in there called Minimalist Network ABM model. Okay. And um, we built a little model that um, had a simple state chart with it was susceptible and infected people. And we ended up having a bit of fun that's not reflected on this side. Well, okay, for me it was fun. I don't know if it was fun for you. Um, uh, I had a bit of fun, um, and I ended up something like this. I don't know if you folks uh, built something like that. But we're going to clean this up, and then we're going to sort of uh, extend it with some messaging. So what I'm going to do here, if you have something like this, I'm just going to delete these extra pieces here and uh, clean that up so that we, we have something that's um, more minimal. I think we had a bi-directional transition originally, yeah. We had some sort of bi-directional transition back from this guy. Um, okay, so I want state chart, and we're doing transition, and I gotta drag this in in this version. Hey, no, no, no. Um, you go up there, and you go down there. Um, okay, uh, and and then uh, we had some some rate with this. I think it was 0.1. Um, and uh, then we had for the infection, I think, Oh, okay, so um, we had a, sorry? We had, oh, we had age, okay, just make the rate 0 0.01, okay, um, for the purposes of starting to add messaging in. And then I'm gonna delete this whole uh, stock and flow, stock and flow model there. And for whatever reason, I force you to delete it in a couple of pieces. Is there a transition from susceptible to susceptible? No, there's no transition from susceptible to susceptible now. It's just uh, susceptible to infected. That's that's right. That's right. Um, okay. So um, so we should have something like this. Are people comfortable with that? Okay. 
So what we're going to do now is, uh, if we have this, if we've cleaned up that stock and flow component, we, we got rid of that extra stuff with the branching, and we're back to, uh, back to two simple rates here, 0 0.01 going here and 0 0.1 going back. Um, let's, let's run this model, make sure it's, uh, it's seaworthy. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna run it. Run it by right-clicking on the simulator start this guy up or this gal and uh, boom okay we have this and you remember we had this sort of uh, holiday um, extravaganza phenomenon um, and uh, most of the most of the agents stay in a susceptible state the rate of going to infective is much smaller but they they blink before our eyes um, so uh, if anyone is having trouble getting that, again, you can use that built-in, uh, the model that I provided to you in the examples.zip. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add in some logic for infection spread here, okay? Um, and there's two pieces of that logic we're going to add in. One thing is we're going to add in a thing that sends messages, and the other we're going to add in some mechanisms at two places that receive messages, okay? So first we're going to add a message from the infective state to its own state, okay? Um, and the logic there, again, is it's going from itself to itself because when you have contact with someone in a way that could spread infection, you don't become uninfective as a result. You stay infective. Hence this, this whoa. Hence this thing um, is, uh, is from itself to itself. We're not leaving the infective state, okay? Um, so here's, here's our little self transition. And we're going to give that transition some logic. So we're going to have it a, give it a rate of 2. So uh, I'll switch back to this. This should have a rate. It's not a timeout. It's a rate of 2. So while you're in that state, twice per time unit, whatever our time unit is, we're going to be firing off this transition. and because the transition is from this state to itself, there's no transition to another state that's going to take place. Instead, what's going to take place, ladies and gentlemen, is the action. And um, the action is going to be, we're going to have send infection to a random connected. Now, uh, I'm going to be a bit pedantic about it and type this dot send, OK? That's really what that means, send. It means I'm telling myself, hey, send it. And I'm going to type in infection, and it's going to go to random, random connected. Now, does anyone remember? I, I'm just doing control space here. It's going to prompt me with this. Um, now, incidentally, you'll notice here uh, if I if I pull up the documentation on these things, you'll notice that there's two variants of send here, and in fact. If you, if you scroll down uh, here, you can see further information on, on uh, the, the meaning of this, uh, this message. And you can start to see some descriptions of sending modes. More inf for more information, you have to go to the reference um, information we saw last time. Now, there was some difference between this and the one we saw in that other built-in analog model. What is the difference? Yeah, this is random connected rather than random neighbor. So random connected means with respect to the network. Who are you connected to in the network immediately? Who are your immediate neighbors in the network? It's going to select one with equal probability from that. What's you the know? difference between that and random neighbor? Random neighbor is in space. Oh, okay. Random neighbor is, is your neighbors within your spatial neighborhood. Random connected is your neighbors in a network. And you can have both operating in the same model. So you have both. Spatial connect, like maybe, maybe I can only infect those who are nearby myself in space, but I can be influenced uh, socially through uh, for my risk attitudes, for my, um, for uh, with respect to my uh, hygienic practices, with respect to my tendency to mix by people who are at a far distance in a social network. And then we define the social network. So we did last time, and we'll, I'll go take a look at this right now to remind us. Okay, so great question. So, so this is the little snippet of code that we have here, okay? Um, so this is send. Now, um, 
Great question about, about the social network. Let's go see where that was. Who remembers where the social network is defined? Where is our social context defined? OK, it's in Maine, because that defines the stage in which these agents circulate. So we know we got to look in Maine. And what sort of thing would it be? Oh, excuse me. I'm looking the wrong model here. I'm look, I should be looking at this model. Excuse me. Um, and where is it defined in Maine? It's in the environment. Yeah. So let's go look at the environment in Maine. Boom. And uh, we go to advanced. And you'll notice here we give two types of information, the spatial information and then the network information. And again, at the end of today's lecture or Friday, we're going to be talking in detail about these different types of networks. But you'll notice that we can specify network information here. And we specified a distance-based network where people are considered connected if they're within 50 spatial units of one another. So they're laid out on a grid first, their location comes first, and then they're connected up based on their location. They're connected up uh, such that they're connected to nearby people. Okay? So that's where we define their spatial context. And what we are doing here is we have set it up so we're now sending an infection message to our neighbors. Now, what would happen, if, ladies and gentlemen, if we ran this right now? What do you think would happen different from before? Do you think anything different would happen? Sorry? Yeah, we're just sending something. No one's listening. If, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Um, well, you can ponder that quandary, but um, here it has no operational impact. These agents are shouting and no one's listening. There's no ears to pick them up. Ladies and gentlemen, we shall not lend the agents ears. Okay, so um, uh, let, it, let, us, let us irify the agents. Um, Okay, so to, to, to irrify them, we are going to go to the infection transition. Well, so, so we're going to have agents infected by this message. And so we've got to think, okay, what's going to be affected by this message? What's how is the, the message going to operationally matter? How is it going to affect things? And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's going to lead people who were susceptible to become infected. If an infected person already is someone already infected and they receive the message, we're going to treat it as not having a significant difference um, in their status. And there's some immunological reasons for that. Among other things, they may have uh, quite high levels of, um, of uh, viral reproduction within them, quite high levels of viremia. And a small additional dose is unlikely to make a difference in the dynamics of that. Another thing, their immune mechanisms may be stirred up. They have these cytotoxic T lymphocytes circulating, and uh, those will quickly attack new infected cells. So in short, we're going to treat infection as a significant event only if you're susceptible. So it's really this transition from susceptible to infected that's of issue here. And we're going to have this become change from being a rate, which occurs at some sort of uh, some general time, uh, time constant. And instead, it's going to be based on a message. So if we go, to that, we go to that transition from susceptible to infected, instead of being a rate, we have it depend on an message. And the message, at this point, there's only one message in the whole model. So we're just going to say unconditional. It's unconditional. It, if you receive a message and you're in the susceptible state, you're going to go to the infective state. We don't have multiple types of messages circulating. So that's one piece we have to, we have to put in place. Okay? Um, and uh, we, can, we can leave it like, uh, leave it like that. We could add an action here. Um, oh, and in fact, we already have an action. We have an action that said, I got infected, and the time is such and such. We'll leave that in place so that we know people are getting infected. So I'd ask you now, if I run this model, will anything be different? Okay, so, so <laughs> yes, there's, there's a key piece missing, which is that there has to be some initial infected, right? There has to be some initial person infected. So we're going to have to deal with that. 
There's actually one more thing as well, and it had to do with the, the issue of multiple state charts. We have to route messages to the state chart. And in fact, by default, that's already done. I mean, if you go look at, at a person here and you go to the, um, to the uh, agent, um, agent parameters here, um, and it says forward message to infection state chart. So that should be fine. This is a newfangled feature in this version of AnyLogic, and I think that should, by default, give us things that used to be added in uh, explicitly. Um, by good practice, you could put something in there um, as well. Okay, but we have to set it up so that someone starts infective, okay? Um, this tells you how you can manually get that state chart to receive the message, okay? Um, okay, so we're gonna have to get an initial person infected. Now, where do we do that? Well, it turns out, that there's another sort of agent uh, or another sort of event that occurs. So if we go to main, there's something what's called the startup code. And that's sort of when the model's starting up what happens. And we have to add something in there. So double click on main and you go to uh, general and there's a thing that says startup code. Mm -hmm. This is an event which occurs. It's the starting of the whole model. And at that point we have to send somebody a message saying you're infected. So what you can do is you can tell the environment, hey, deliver to a random person in this model the infection message, okay? So we, we have to say, hey, environment, do this. Now, to be, to be pedantic about it, I'm gonna say this dot environment, come on, uh, dot environment dot deliver, control space, deliver to all or deliver to random? Deliver to random, and it's gonna say uh, infected. Okay, um, so here, this is again with respect to Maine. We're in Maine because that's sort of the, the global environment in which these agents are being started up. And this is something which doesn't concern a particular agent um, or all agents. It concerns a uh, job in the environment to start one agent as infective. So for the startup code for Maine, we have it say, hey, my environment, this dot environment, my environment, now in that environment, deliver this message to a random, random agent. Okay? So because we don't analyze infection or message infection or infected, right. it doesn't matter. Th that's right. I, I, can't, I was trying to remember what it was to be consistent. Is it infection? Yeah. It is. Okay, yeah. then make it infection. If we paid attention, mm -hmm. that would make a big difference. And actually, this is one of the reasons it's it's not great practice to use a string because you can easily make a mistake if I've made it uncapitalized and, and uh, it's a better practice to use something called an enum and, and we'll see that at a later point, but yeah. Can specify how many the Yeah, so for example, um, we could have something in main that's a parameter that would be the number of initial people who are infected. And at this point, what we do is loop sort of count up to that and just send these random infection messages to different people. Okay? Okay, so we put that additional place, uh, additional piece into place. Let's run this thing. Okay, so we can run it in two places. We could run it down here by right clicking on this or we could run it uh, from this menu up here. But it tells us, oh, there's a problem. Okay, it told us a syntax error. Okay, so I had a friend who, um, got into computer programming when she was uh, in junior high school and she was tutoring a young kid in computer programming and he was complaining about stinkax errors that he, <laughs> he received from the, from, the, from the system. And, and it's not stinkax, it's syntax. The syntax error tells us something's wrong in the phrasing of our, mess, uh, of our, of our uh, program, the phrasing of our model. And in this case, it's a very simple thing. It's missing a semicolon. Any logic is quite inconsistent about where it requires semicolons and where it doesn't. And we've just run into this. We need, ladies and gentlemen, something at the end of this, kind of like putting a period or exclamation point or question mark at the end of a sentence. It indicates, okay, we're done with this command to any logic. We're done with this statement. So we need a semicolon there for it to be happy. So, you know, this is something that the compiler god demands to, to, to um, run our model, and we've granted it still, we should be able to run it. Okay, um, by the way, you'll notice how I did that. 
I should have I should have actually used that as a teaching opportunity. Um, if I went back to Maine, this when this was missing, and I tried to run the model. Um, well, I'll do it through this way, which is the most familiar way to you. You'll notice it it had a little message there, and I double clicked on it to be brought to where the problem was. I can also go hover over this, and it will tell me what the message is. Okay, the the problem. It's telling me it can't turn this into something that can run. It doesn't know how to run this thing because of this problem. And it basically is saying, hey, fix it. Fix it before I run this. And so I fixed it, and now we can run it. OK, so we run this thing, and up comes our, our little interface here. And hey, come on. Um, and what we should have is some measure of spread of infection. It's not a chance that this is occurring here. OK, this little component got infected, but it can't go anywhere else. The question asked earlier is very relevant, because if we had multiple seeds, it could have started somewhere else. Right. Um, so uh, this is an issue with, um, with uh, the processing of uh, sort of processing of events and there's something called a, 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 a scale violation which I believe has to do with something along the lines of two events occurring at the same time. It's not something that's an error message, it's something having to do with its processing of the infection. So in this case it's nothing to worry about. So if we stop this what we'll see over here in the console window is reports of infection of different agents. Different agents got infected and um, these uh, agents were actually drawn from uh, the same small class of agents. It was agents 50, 51, uh, 57, and 31 that were right there in a group. Now, if I were to run this model again, um, we, might, uh, we might anticipate some uh, different, different results. So uh, here we go, and we have a different seed and now it's spreading over a larger component of the network. Some people are occasionally recovering, but it's again spreading to, uh, to, to those who have recovered. There's no long-lasting immunity, and, and we have it sort of uh, in one component, but not spreading to others. So that's an example of a simple network spread model. We had several components. We had sending of messages. We had receiving of messages. We had Implicitly, we had routing of messages from the person to state charts, although that was taken care of us direct for us um, automatically. And then we had to seed an initial person. Okay? Simple network based. Yes. Yep. Okay. No, okay. Let me distinguish between two things here. Um, thank you for asking that question. We actually, and maybe I was. I, I was uh, approaching it with too little attention to, to, the, to the learning um, uh, on two different models. So let me, let me distinguish that. So that's one model where we've been modifying it. There was a second model we were looking at. So we've just been looking at two different models. One of them was a built-in model with any logic that comes with any logic, this, this model here. And here, we are sending it to neighbors in a grid, okay? With our model that we just built, we are instead sending it to what? To neighbors in a network, okay? Now, this is a random network. This network uh, for this other model, I mean, excuse me, this uh, spatial layout was we saw before. It's this one here. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. You may remember this, this one here. Um, where we have a, uh, a spatial layout and people are sending the messages to their neighbors. So when someone gets infected here, one of these red dots on the periphery, um, they're going to send messages to their neighbors in I believe the eight different directions um, from there saying that you're infected. Does that make sense? So, so here's the, the grid-based layout. Our layout for our, our environment for this other uh, model, in fact, doesn't specify a grid. In fact, if we were to go up to look at the environment here, um, what we would see 
is that it's a continuous space. It doesn't, it's not a discrete space. Discrete space is where, is where we'd have grids, okay? Okay, so even do that like it's random. What I'd suggest that you do is go down it's a good question. Go down to your um, experiment, okay? Mm -hmm. And go look under the general tab mm -hmm. and see see where it says random number generation? Oh, it says fixed seed. S fixed seed. So it's probably you need yeah. to set it to to random seed. Okay. okay. Um so to be clear about this, um, and what Sergey just asked about is uh, why is it that in his case, every time you run it, it's basically the same thing. But in my case, every time I ran it, I got a different network. And it's because I told it to have unique simulation runs. To fix the, you can have reproducible simulation runs. And there's a good reason to do that. If you're trying to debug your model, for example, if you're trying to figure out why it's not working, you want it to be reproducible. If you want to have a very um, systematic depiction of it for some reason, you want it to be reproducible. Um, but sometimes you want to be able to look at the different variations on it for different runs. So two different situations. Address your question? OK. OK, so um, here we have infection percolation over the network. OK, so those are my comments on um, message sending. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions on this. But next, I want to go on to talk about uh, events um, and, and how events are handled in any logic uh, and how we can have explicit uh, static and deterministic events. So with your leave, I